pretty straightforward. If you want to go deeper, you can join us. There was like a, a church fair at Southeastern that we went to, and it was kind of like, let me tell you why my church is better than your church. I just wanted to puke at the event. It's just like, definitely, definitely not me, but uh, I don't want to try to win you over uh, why you should come here. praying that the Holy Spirit will connect you into a church in Lakeland that you can be fed at and you can go deeper. And, uh, graduate of Southeastern, myself and my wife, and uh, just left there, um, I guess you could say, just really unsatisfied with the experience and wanted so much more. And, uh, you know, we're wanting to create that for students and for families alike, just to go deeper um, in the Lord. So we welcome you. I um, also wanted to say a special thank you f- uh, to all those that celebrated uh, two years with us on Thursday. Um, we planted the church two years ago this past Thursday. Thank you for your gift cards, your uh, notes, uh, monetary gifts. So we really appreciate it. Really uh, blessed us. Um, two short years. I can't imagine what the next two years are going to be like. Uh, that's really exciting. Um, so we are going to start a building fund. I know there's a lot of extra space in here. We probably don't need to leave soon. Just kidding. Um, we are starting a building fund. Um, as most of you might realize, uh, there's not really much room in here. We are looking at several different buildings. So we do have a vision. And um, a lot of the buildings that we looked at, most of them are warehouses. And like you see here, we built this out, and that will require uh, build-out money. So um, we're looking between seventy-five to hundred thousand dollars um, to build that out. But that seems like a lot of money. Uh, but I was encouraged the other day when my buddies he's raised two point two million for his. So I said, "Praise God!" <laughs> uh, but we're looking at a building uh, right now in Lake Mirror, right in downtown Lakeland. It's about a fifteen thousand square foot warehouse. I could see five to six hundred classrooms, different stuff like that. So we're just really the plan is to move. My heart is to move in there January first or somewhere right around there. I know it's going to take a little while to raise some money, but we're just going to start one of those thermometer things. If you guys know what I'm talking about, and you, you know you go up and whatever. So we're going to, if you want to make that, we'll have a special account now in the bank account if you'd like to write to building fund. Um, we're just going to have a few months. Um, there's no pressure in doing that. If you have a heart to do that, um, we have, you know, we have that. Some people pledge some money, but that's exciting. I'm, I'm super excited. The Lord, it's like every time we move, a lot of you guys know this. This is our third building in two years. Every time we move, God fills it up. Every time we move, we fill up. So I'm really wanting a vision beyond the vision. I'd like to move somewhere, and if He fills it up, we still have more space. And um, so that's exciting. So please uh, pray with us in that. Um, Getting to the word this morning, um, you know, I, I kind of want to preface this morning by sharing with you kind of how Jeremiah prepares for messages. Um, I I went to Southeastern and they wanted you to like present a 52 week sermon series. Um, a lot of pastors at the beginning of the year kind of set out, you know, this is what they want to preach on, and I just wrote Holy Spirit and turned it in and got an F. So that kind of that kind of tells you a little about a bit about me. Um, I like to just get something out of hot out of the oven and hand it to you fresh. Um, I don't like stale bread. Um, I just I just feel like a lot of stuff is so planned out. And again, I'm not bashing planning all that stuff. But the way that I prepare is I ask God this: What are you saying now? Okay, that's like the now is part of the prophetic. God, I don't like. Yeah, you know, I mean, when you, part of, like, you know, I sit in my office, you know, and it's just like, I, we could go anywhere. We could go in the Old Testament, the New Testament, I could tell you some stories. I mean, it's kind of like, whatever, I mean, it, you know, you, you can pull out your playbook and go anywhere with people, but that's just not what I like to do. I really like to say, Lord, what are you saying for us in this hour? And something that the Lord really began to breathe into my heart this week is just uh, the term frustration. And I really believe that the body of Christ, and especially um, America, we're in one of the most frustrated ages that we have ever lived in. People are frustrated about politics, economy, family situations. Uh, How do I get myself out of this hole that I'm in? Uh, What's next? I can't hear God. I'm having family problems. Uh, What about my business? I mean, there is just like this intense level of frustration that I believe that that we are feeling right now, and I don't know about you, but there just always seems to be something that I'm frustrated about. Um, I don't 
know if you've ever had a to-do list. Um, you know, you set out to do 20 things, and by the end of the day, you've only got one done. That's pretty frustrating. Or when your college football team gets smashed like 52 to 13. That's pretty frustrating. <laughs> You know, there, there are just there are things that are frustrating in life, and um, the, the title of this morning's message is called Frustration, the Great Catalyst for Change. I want to uh, provide a perspective this morning that might be different, a different opinion or a perception on frustration um, than you've ever heard before. Um, a lot of times in life when things come to us and we're not sure how to deal with them, we treat them as the enemy. For example, I've always treated the longings of my heart as the enemy. The longing to be loved, the longing to be accepted. I was so fearful of being rejected that I treated longings as an enemy rather than as a friend. And I think that a lot of people, when you use the term frustration, they do not see it as a friend. They see it as an enemy. Frustration is bad. And I want where I want to go this morning is I believe that frustration can, in fact, be from the Lord. And frustration can be an agent of change in our lives. So before you treat frustration in your life as the enemy or from Satan, give it a second look this morning. Can you do that for me? Frustration could be a catalyst for change in our lives. Would you just go to the Lord in prayer with me. Father, I pray over the next few minutes, Lord, that you would awaken frustration that we've suppressed. Lord, I pray that we'd stop rejecting it, Lord, and that we would embrace it. Lord, I really pray leaving here that we would be a people that would embrace frustration. Help us to see it as an agent of change. Jesus name. Amen. Frustration is a, a byproduct of goals and dreams that we have that are unfulfilled or unaccomplished. Um, I, a couple of things, and, and a lot of this is prophetic, and just I, I felt like the Lord was saying to me that there's someone here, you spent half your life training for a profession or getting an education or spending all this money only to realize that it, at this point in your life, that, that, that training or that education or that money isn't really worth much of all in this season. Could that be frustrating? Or how about being frustrated over unfulfilled dreams, the longing for a whole and complete relationship, only to have been walking around with pieces of broken hearts, yours included. I think relational frustration is something that we're all accustomed to. How many people have ever been frustrated about a relationship? You thought it was going to go this way. You, a marriage, a friendship. It, it, it's inevitable in life. And I, I just want us to, when you say, I'm frustrated, what you're saying is, I had goals or dreams or desires that are now unfulfilled or unachieved. That's why I'm frustrated. That's step one. Most people don't know why they're frustrated. Well, I'm frustrated. Why? I have no idea. Frustration comes when dreams and goals and desires that we have in our hearts, when those become unfulfilled or unachieved, frustration will begin to fester. Does that make sense? What we have to be very careful of is this. Anger and rage are the byproducts of frustration that is not dealt with in a healthy way. So first we become frustrated. Unachieved goals, dreams, desires, relationships aren't working out frustrated. If you don't give those frustrations to the Lord in a healthy way, you will then become angry and then you will then become filled with rage. It's a three-step process. Counselors use this in their office. I'm going to share with you a dream that I had about this where the Lord just gave me some revelation and insight, okay? If you're angry about something and you're full of rage this morning, you need to trace it back to frustration. Why am I frustrated? A lot of us can't even communicate while we're angry and mad. I had it out in the parking lot. I got in a fight with God one day. I didn't win. But I just, I just decided to go on a parking lot. I was at Southeastern my senior year. And I just thought, I'm just going to give it to God today. I'm just going to tell him all my frustrations, why I'm angry, why I'm mad, why I'm full of rage, all that stuff. 
And I just yelled and yelled and yelled and all this different stuff. And he just started naming off to me. You're, you're angry and mad because this and this and this dream isn't met yet. And this goal you had wasn't achieved. And all this different stuff. And the Lord just started giving me some insight in, in, into what it is. But I, I want I want us, it's really a two-part thing. If you don't deal with your frustration in a healthy way, it becomes a catalyst for anger and rage. If you deal with your frustration in a healthy way, it becomes a catalyst for change. You're taking notes, you don't leave her. Hear me. If frustrations, if our frustrations, all those unfulfilled desires, dreams, and goals, if those are dealt with in a healthy way, giving them to the Lord, God will use your frustrations to bring about change. But if you suppress your frustrations, you don't communicate them, you bottle them up inside, they will become a catalyst for a life of anger and rage, whether it's toward God, toward other people, or toward a situation, it will happen. And I believe, like I was saying, in the earth right now, people are so frustrated with the economy, with the, the politics. I'll tell you what, if you ask me what part of the Father ministry is all about, I would say this, part of the Father ministry is a gathering of people that are frustrated over the way we're doing church today. Is that a fair statement? I didn't say angry and full of rage, but I believe that there is a there is a, a, a dream that people have in their heart about the way church can be done, and they've been in environments all their life where they knew it wasn't right or it wasn't what they wanted, so there's a gathering of frustrated people here. But when you put it in the context of, wait a minute, if we don't deal healthily with our frustrations as a group of people, guess what the result is going to be? We are going to become angry and full of rage at other churches. But see, if we healthily channel our frustrations and give them to the Lord, guess who's going to bring change to this city? Okay, you guys with me? Let me share this dream. You guys know I'm a dreamer. You know, I get tired when I wake up because God won't leave me alone. Okay, people are like, you get rested when you sleep? No, not at all. Not at all. My God, leave me alone. God speaks to me a lot of my sleep. People ask me, what is it like to be you? I said, I don't know. I feel like I never sleep. Um, I, I had a dream, and there were two people that were in front of me. And I knew these two people, and they held up um, kind of like a, a placard or, or a poster board. They each had a poster board in front of them. And the first one said anger, and the second one said rage. And I was looking at these people, and I knew that they kind of dealt with some issues. But as I looked at them and I said, Lord, what's going on? Out from behind them stepped two dark demons. Okay? So I'm looking at these guys, anger and rage. And I'm like, okay, Lord, what am I looking at? And out from behind them steps two dark forms demons. Red eyes seen them before. I said to the Lord, I said, anger and rage isn't demonic, is it? And he said to me, it absolutely is. When you allow frustration to fester in your heart, the enemy will attach himself to those things. In fact, the enemy will attach himself to anything that we don't remove in our life that's not from the Lord. It was a revelation to me. I know a lot of angry people, they get mad, all this different stuff, full of rage. But to put it in the context of it's actually demonic, the demonic attaches itself to angry people that are full of rage. was a real like eye-opener to me. But the Lord was showing me the root of it was frustration that's not been dealt with. What are some frustrations this morning that you have that are undealt with? What are you angry about? Let's start there. I know we can all play church and all, nothing's wrong. I'm fine. I'm not frustrated about anything. Whoa. What gets you going? My job. Your job. What else? Talk to me. People not listening. Who else? Relationships. My future. Your future. Yourself. Frustrated with yourself. Anybody else? 
parenting. All right, now we're getting real. <laughs> what is it? Fakers, hypocrites. Okay, friends that are complacent with God. Finances. Amen. Rain. <laughs> Graduation. It doesn't matter what it is. Point being, there are all things that we can release to the Lord. Yes. Okay, there's, a, there's an invitation. I think that like God is sounding the alarm to us in this hour saying, beware of not dealing with your frustrations. <clears throat> If you release them to me, we're going to talk about that just a little bit. If your frustrations, if you learn how to embrace them and give them to me, it'll be a catalyst for changing your life. If you do not deal with them healthily, you anger and result, anger, excuse me, and rage will become the byproducts of frustration. It's real clear. It's an invitation. The enemy's saying, hey, don't deal with them. Sweep them under the rug. It's all good. And the Lord is saying, I, I want to deal with these just want to share just a little bit what the Lord is speaking to me. He, he said the truth is most people are frustrated because they care about something or someone. People that are frustrated are oftentimes rejected by leadership because they're so difficult to accommodate. Frustration forces us to think about the future. I found that, that and this is me personally, I found that in circles where frustration is not present, Apathy, lethargy begin to set in. Hey, if nobody's making waves, everything must be okay. What if frustration is a safeguard against complacency? Now we're going to get in the Father's perspective. What if frustration is keeping you from falling asleep at the wheel? I really believe that in any company, in any church, in any business, in any, there should be someone frustrated about something. Because if they're not, no one really cares. Amen. And I think that that's, that's what, where we're going in the world. Everyone's silent. Everyone is surrendered. Everyone is just, just go ahead and do whatever. I'm, so, I'm sick and tired of fighting. What if we began to see our frustrations as a friend rather than the enemy? Frustration never allows us to settle for anything. Status quo is the enemy of frustration. Frustration often, oftentimes leads us to raising the hard questions that we would normally not ask. Frustration often leads us to asking the hard questions. There were a, a, a myriad of things presented here. Frustrated about what? What kind of questions are your are, are, is your frustrations or are your frustrations rising in your life right now? I believe that frustration causes you to ask questions that you normally wouldn't ask. I mean, some of it's bad. Like, should I marry her? Should I have taken this job? Should I have moved here? Should I have? But you normally would never ask those questions if, every, if you're not frustrated, correct? Frustration pushes you to the limit and says it's time to really ask the hard questions. And I believe even in leadership positions, we don't know how to accommodate or deal with frustrated people because they push you about a vision for the future. See, they rock the boat of complacency. And I'm really telling you, I really believe that the Lord spoke to my heart and said the future of this church in particular is directly associated to how we deal with the frustration and the questions that come inside these doors. I didn't really like to hear that. Sorry. I mean, there are, I mean, maybe we'll just talk about the church for a little bit, but gee whiz. There, there is like the most frustrated people ever on the face of the earth with church. It's crazy. I'm like, can somebody tell me something good about the church? I mean, just this and that and critical and judgmental spirit. And they're like way beyond frustrated. They're like full of anger and rage. They want to take the guy out. They want to 
burn the church down and all this, all this crazy stuff. And we've got to begin to see, wow, frustration. And, and here's what I want to say. It, it's not about asking questions. It's about asking the right questions. When you begin to get frustrated and those hard questions come, hear me. It's not about asking questions. It's about asking the right questions. It's one of the pieces of the puzzle over my journey the past five years that just was breathed into me by somebody else. It's, it's not about asking questions. It's about asking the right questions. Do you know that if, if somebody that, who's somebody, uh, Boomer, who's somebody that you look up to that's famous? Okay, I'll, I'll uh, Kenny Chesney. <laughs> okay. What is it? Luke Bryan. Okay. If you only had less than five minutes to talk to Luke Bryan, would you just ask him anything that came to your head? That would probably be a waste of time. I mean, if you only got a certain amount of time with someone, you would probably ask them the five most important questions that you wanted them to answer. Yes? If, if, if you got time with somebody, you just went, blah, 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 blah. okay, I didn't really learn anything, I didn't hear anything. When we're with the Lord, I think that sometimes we have to ask the right questions if we really want answers. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going to be bold. I prayed to the Lord in a question and he told me that was a really stupid question. That, that was that was all your flesh. That was we wonder why we never get answers because if, if they're not Holy Spirit questions, they're not going to get answered. And that's the secret. God will give you. You ready? God will give you the right questions to ask, and because they're His questions, He has to answer them. I just gave you a secret formula. Let God. Give you the questions when frustration comes up. Let God give you the questions to ask because if they're His questions, He has to answer them. Some of us are, no, this and that. He's not even interested in answering you because they're not His questions. We must understand that in seasons of frustration, it's not about giving up. It's about giving in. Man, I've been so frustrated. It's not like, God, I give up. I'm like, I, and that wasn't a surrender. It was, I'm done. Kill me. I'm tired of all this stuff. And the Lord says, you know, Jeremiah, when you say I give up, that shows your independence and your rebellion. But when you give in, it shows your dependence upon me. So I had to switch up my language. When I get frustrated, I'm like, I don't tell God, oh, I give up. I say, God, I give in. I surrender. I'm just going to lean into you. When you're in a season of frustration and there's, there's things that are on, you know, pulling on you, I have, a, I have a question for you. What does God want to be for you in this season that He couldn't be in any other season? God want to be for you in this season that it couldn't be in any other season? Hey, I mean, when you're making a lot of bank and everything's good, you're, you're probably not necessarily going to know God as provider. I mean, yeah, He provided, but maybe He's working on you on something else. Maybe He's revealing how gracious He is, how merciful it is. You know, that next season when you've got nothing and He really is your source, guess what He'll reveal Himself to you as? Provider. I'm telling you, all God, I think that people are saying, but frustrations from Satan, this can't be from God. And God wants to say, oh yeah, it's indeed from me. Because I want to be someone for you in this season that I could not be because of your circumstance in any other season. See, we're on this ebb and flow as sons and daughters of the Father. He is constantly revealing His character and nature, different parts to us. He wants to, that's every, almost instantaneously, when something bad happens, a bad phone or whatever, I say, okay, God, what do you want to be for me in this season that you couldn't be in any other season? He wants to school us. 
He wants to literally take us to school and say, the school is called the hard knocks of life. You just got to live it. He gave us a promise. You will have trouble. But take hope. But take hope. I, I'm, I'm with you. I want to reveal myself to you. Frustration and the answers it will generate are a precursor to real growth and change. Frustration and the answers that it will generate are a precursor to growth and change. If you will turn to your Bibles to Ephesians 4, kind of have you guys out of here by 4 o'clock. Chapter 4, we're going to start reading in verse 29. You guys with me this morning? I just believe that this is a timely word and a timely season. The Lord wants to, to shift our directions. Ephesians 4, verse 29, it says this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as Christ in God forgave you. I've heard people read verse 31 without reading the first two verses, and what we have to understand is all of those things listed in verse 31 are what quench and grieve the Spirit of God. It's not just get rid of them. It's knowing that when you allow those things to fester in your heart and they get they don't go undealt with, don't wonder why the Holy Spirit's being grieved. Don't wonder why He seems distant. You have to get rid of all those things. And again, the rage, anger, malice, slander, unforgiveness, all that stuff, when you do not communicate in a healthy way your frustrations, all those things become the result. You got to go back to the root. A lot of you guys are trying to fight your anger and your rage and your you're talking about all these different people, and God's like, you're frustrated. Go, go, go back. I'm allowing this. I wanted to read you the, the message translation. It says, Watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps. Each word is a gift. Don't grieve God. Don't break his heart. The Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life. Don't take such a gift for granted. Make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, and profane talk. Be gentle and sensitive with one another. Forgive one another as quickly as Christ forgave you. I really thought the Lord started talking about a lot of wives in this room that are very frustrated. And the Lord said to me, the lack of communication in your marriage is causing you to be angry and resentful or even rageful toward your husbands. You need to talk through frustrations. Stop suppressing them. Moms and dads, don't be surprised at the anger and rage you see in your own children. They are mirroring what they have seen in you. If you do not learn how to share frustrations when they arise, they never will. But the Lord said to me, it's not too late. I really, I want to I wanna give a public challenge. I really felt like the Lord said to me to tell the families in this room that you need to have a meeting this week. You need to have a meeting at your house. You need to gather up your wife and your children. And you need to say, let's deal with the frustrations. What are they? What are they? Let's just, let's, let's put them on the table. Some of you guys need to make phone calls and tell someone that doesn't even know that you're mad at them why you're mad at them. Somebody needs to call home. Somebody needs to, well, we can just all be good with our bondage. I don't know. I don't know about you, but I want to be free. I don't know about you, but I want to be free. I, I challenge you. Every family in this room, every marriage, every whatever it want to be, I really believe that the Lord is scheduling a meeting this week, a family meeting, a personal meeting, say, deal with the frustration right now. What is it that's bothering you? And by the way, don't talk when someone else is talking. That causes frustration. Next prayer. Turn to Colossians 3. 
or some kid at Southeast who said, whoa, dude, that church, like, they're, they're for real. They, like, offend you. I don't know. Jesus is coming back for an unoffended bride. He's longing for us to grow. Just some of us have settled for this frustration. The Lord says, I want to use that in your life. Colossians 3, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but you must now rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of the Creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Verse 12, Therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive what other grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. I want to touch just a little bit on forgiveness. There's a lot of relational frustration, and I really believe that the Lord gave me word, and He said the strength of a critical and judgmental spirit is found in the lack of face-to-face -face interaction with the person that we're offended with. Ready? The strength of a critical and judgmental spirit is found in the lack of face-to-face -face interaction with the person that we're offended with. <laughs> You'll probably feel a lot better if you're frustrated with someone if you go talk to them. It's called relational living. But we've created really seeker-friendly environments in the church and in our lives where uh, we don't deal with that stuff here. Uh, we just sweep everything under the rug and act like it's all okay. The strength, if you, it's okay. If you're operating in a critical and judgmental sphere right now about someone or something, I'm telling you, that thing will die if you talk to, with that person. But see, the strength of it is, I'm just going to talk and do this and say that and all this different stuff and just not say anything. Is that for anybody? I really believe that the enemy is openly, he's not hiding, he's openly inviting us to be critical about other people. He's openly telling us, I want you to judge this person. I want you to be angry about this. I, I want you to be full of rage. I, I want you to be so frustrated with this person that you just can't even communicate. One of the things that I've been saying that I, I just want to make clear this morning as I said, talking through your frustrations, not talking about your frustrations. The Lord told me that there's a lot of husbands in here that are hard of hearing. I didn't, I didn't say letting your wife talk about her frustrations. I said letting your wife talk through her frustrations. Lord says you won't because you're afraid of change. We'll close with 1 Samuel 30. Okay. 1 Samuel 30. I, I was asking the Lord, you know, Lord, who, who is the most frustrated dude in the Bible? Who is the guy that was, and the Lord said, King David. King David was so frustrated. And he, he just started talking. He said, man, how would you like to be anointed king? And you, you spent most of your life running. Yeah, I mean, all, all of these years. And the Lord said, how would you like I mean, you're talking to people about communicating your frustration. To me, it's a little hard to communicate your frustration when you're on the run all the time. I mean, this, this guy, I was, you know, looking at the people that surrounded King David. And the 
scriptures you can find it in 1 Samuel 22. But there were three types of people that surrounded King David. Very clear. Those that were in debt. Those that were discontented. And those that were in distress. Mighty King David. 400 men. Mighty warriors of the kingdom. Kingdom Surrounded David. And guess what type of people these were. Not the rich. Not the most in debt. In distress, in discontented. Does that sound frustrated to you? Frustrated people surrounded a frustrated man. And here in, in 1 Samuel 30, David's like at his wit's end. He has been running, he has been hiding. The, I really believe that the Lord said there are some people here that are at your wit's end. Whether you want to admit it or not, the frustration has built to such a degree that you're about to turn into God or turn away from Him. I mean, it, it is that serious. And I just feel like the Lord had a, had a word of encouragement. 1 Samuel 30, here we go. David and his men reached Ziglag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziglag. They had attacked Ziglag and burned it and had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziglag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David, too, his wives had been captured. I don't know how to spell their names. Verse 6. David was greatly distressed because of the men who were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because his, of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. I'm going to stop right there. I mean, how many know that the devil doesn't fight fair? I mean, come on, at least do something when I'm, I'm here. At, at least, like, bring a, a catastrophe to my life that I planned for. I mean, isn't that why we get fr I mean, frustrated? Like, I wasn't ready. I, I didn't plan for that. I didn't ask for that. I didn't do something to receive this. I, I didn't do anything. Just leave me alone. David, a frustrated people, following a frustrated man. He could have killed Saul at any moment. I mean, this guy at any moment could have said, you know, what did Matt say? Don't touch the Lord's anointed. I mean, this guy, he just, within a grasp, he comes to where his, his wife and children and all this, and it just taken away. Just taken away, just complete disaster. His men are talking of stoning his best friends. I mean, it was just a, a heavy situation. It says this, it says, but David found strength in the Lord is God. Or another translation says, David found encouragement in who he knew God to be. I believe that this is one of the words for the hour. If you're frustrated in here, if you have dreams and goals and desires, broke things that just are not working out for you in this season, it's time that you find strength in the Lord your God. You know, there are some seasons when no one is going to encourage you. You know, there are some seasons where no one is going to know what you're going through. And if you rely so heavily on the encouragement of other people, you will fall. This was about David growing up. This is about him, because to me, the reason why I love this story is within, scholars say within 24 hours of this great catastrophe or disaster that happened, he was crowned king over Israel. Because the next story we find that King Saul had died. So really, this is about a great promotion. This is about the Lord saying, this is a final testing of your heart. Will you find strength in me in this season? Even beyond communicating our frustrations to the Lord, I think that some of us need to go out in the parking lot and start sharing our frustrations with the Lord. Oh, yeah, he knows them. Well, you know what? If you share them, you'll probably feel a lot better. Has anybody just said, God, I'm frustrated? Anybody care to try that? Maybe this week, God, oh, I'm frustrated. This isn't working out. And then you go to the, maybe the person that you're frustrated with or you just begin to release it. I mean, I really saw like in the spirit like big balloons in here that God just wants to take and pop. So much pressure. I mean, some of you guys in this room, you feel like you are carrying a 10,000 pound weight around and you are just dying and dying to lay it on the altar. And God's saying today's the day. You don't have to carry it anymore. You can begin to see the frustration.
frustration in your life as a catalyst for change when you deal with it. But the Lord is in that is also warning us. He's saying if you don't deal with this in a healthy way, anger and rage will begin to fill your heart. So the first thing that we can do with frustration is in it. Find strength in the Lord, in the Lord alone, like David did. Let's keep reading in 7. He said, Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephah. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he said. You will overtake them and succeed in the rescue. Something that my second point is that the ephod represents a high priestly garment. It, 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 I believe it symbolizes the prayer closet. I really believe that some of the most critical and judgmental people out there are the ones that are called to the deepest form of intercession. So true. Maybe God is showing you the nasty things about people and asking you to pray for them rather than use it as ammunition against them. Yeah, right. Maybe God is showing you the nasty things about people so that you can pray for them rather than use it as ammunition against them and to let everybody else know how bad of a person they are. That's not God. So David called for the... I mean, don't, don't you think he could have done something else? He found strength in the Lord. He went in his prayer closet. I mean, he's like at his wit's end. We have all this stuff going. Let's take it to the Lord in prayer. And then it, it says that he asked a question. Here we go. He asked the right questions. Because probably in prayer, he knew the right question to ask. And the Lord answered and said, yeah, pursue them. I believe the Lord is saying, yeah, pursue those relationships that you're frustrated about. I'm going to give you victory. Yeah. I believe that the Lord is saying and giving us a promise this morning. But if you're frustrated with people and things, you need to set up an appointment and share with this person the frustrations that you're dealing with. And the Lord is promising victory. I can't promise the victory in a way that you want it to be. But it will be victory in His eyes. I feel like the Lord just wants to upgrade us this morning. I like that word. It's kind of grand cook worthy. He wants to update us. The Lord wants to say, you know what? Let me give you a little different perspective on your frustration. Stop seeing it as the enemy. And I want you to see it as a friend. I want to use frustration. And I love to think about that. You know what? I, I should always be frustrated about something. That's kind of crazy. Like most of no, 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 don't be frustrated. Maybe frustration is what keeps us from complacency. I think that God is raising up a, fr a frustrated generation at Southeastern University. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the frustration is going to be through the roof. Now remember, leadership has a very hard time dealing with frustrated people because they ask the questions that we're not ready to answer. But it gives us a vision for the future. If there are things that deal with it. It's from the Lord. Don't suppress it. Embrace it. I encourage you to have a family meeting this week. Maybe you don't know. Maybe somebody's holding something in that they're too afraid to say. I know a lot of times we just hush, hush people. Don't speak that. Even in the meeting, don't speak your frustration. What? That is so unhealthy. I know you don't want to hear it, so I'm talking about, I'm not talking about hearing about your frustrations. I'm talking about working through them. You know, I'd rather have 50 frustrated people here in Heart of the Father than 500 apathetic ones. I'd rather have 175 or 200 frustrated people than 5,000 apathetic ones. Make ways. What if God's calling us to be wave makers in our generation? What if he's saying it's time to stop accepting the status quo, the way that things have always been? We want you to communicate it in a healthy way, yes. not giving you permission to get angry and mad at people. Yes. If you don't like the way that something is done, build a relationship and affect change. If you don't like the way that something is being done, build a relationship and affect change. And if you can't, you probably belong somewhere else. Okay.
want to just prophesy over a few people. And the Lord gave me probably a list of 20 names that I really felt like He said this message was in particularly for you, but it also could be for you know really anybody else. But um, the guy in the back right there, the gray shirt, will you stand up? Yeah. are drawing near my son for you will no longer follow but you will lead do not count past sins against yourself for know that I will use it all even in the days where you felt like you were away from me I was using them up until this very hour to draw you near to me you will be a man of war but you will also be a man of love you will wear unique armor in my army, says the Lord. On one side there will be much protection but you will go into wars and you will rescue people. You will call them out of darkness. But the other side of this armor is very lovely. It's full of garment. It's a high priestly garment. The Lord says there's even pastoral ministry in the future. But you will do both. You will war you will fight for people. You will also love them and pastor them well. So take heart. Stop looking at your past as time away from me. And start looking at your past as time that you were with me even when you did not know it. This is a season of girding up your loins. This is a season of surrounding yourself with other warriors. Others that are frustrated. Others that know how to communicate their frustration in a healthy way. I will raise you up and I will train you in all sorts of areas of warfare, even deliverance, and even inner healing. These are the things that will come. But know that I am interested in your present development now. I'm interested in your present development now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Like the pen of a writer. In Paul in the scriptures, he said that we should all be living epistles, that our lives should be the message. I really believe that the Lord says to not worry about when you yourself couldn't communicate what your heart was longing for. But in this season, you're really going to be able to give language to what the Lord is calling you to. And your life will be the message. And I just see all sorts of creativity and design, even missions, some, some very unique things that God has for you. And I just really believe that the Lord says to rest and know that I am God. Do not let anxiety, worry, and fear ravage your heart. I just see like a healthy vineyard. And the Lord wants you to know that He's really desiring that you protect your heart in this season. Protect it. It's, it's your wellspring. It's your life. So, Father, I just pray, Lord, that she would protect her heart, Lord, that you would use her, Lord, that you would use her life to communicate a message. It's just not about talking. It's about your life being the message to those. You're such a, a powerful testimony really from an early age that the Lord has really saved and gone through some things, but there is pieces of your heart that have been reserved for the Lord alone. And the Lord is really designed to speak to you and even just words for you, just a love for you. There's a healing even in your heart of a past relationship. The Lord is just bringing healing. He's bringing restoration. And he's really going to lavish His love on you in this season. So Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. We'd like to these people to stand up. Matt Hillegas, Chris Hinojosa, uh, Joel Sanders, uh, and Sheila uh, Paul, you can stay standing. Josiah, Sean Harlicker, Missy Tremel, Joe Johnson, Allison Herndon, Steve Madden, Maggie and Dennis DeSmith, Sarah Johnson, Otis and Shirley Barnett, Jerrica Ryan, Jessica DeVere, Andrew and Annette Graves, Drew Sala Crutchfield, Peter McFarland, Philip. Um, if your name is Sarah, if your name is Matthew, if your name is John. If you sit down, you can receive this too. This is just, the Lord gave me a word of prophecy. And if you will, just close your eyes and just receive it. This is just, I wrote it down. Hope that's okay. This is what the Lord said to me. A new level 
of communication and favor is being released over you. An oil of joy is coming upon you. Popping of a balloon, the pressure being released. Do not carry others' burdens. Release, I release you of feeling responsible for other people's mistakes and failures. Forgive yourself. Stop worrying. Spend as much time praying for them as you do talking about them. What if the pain and heartache you went through was necessary to your spiritual growth? What if your rejection at the hands of men has led you right into my perfect will? What if your current and past circumstances are not the problem? What if your view of them is? What if I have placed you in a difficult place to bring light and life? Are you asking me questions or are you questioning me? Is the real reason you criticize and judge others is because you want the position that they hold? Because you think you could do it better? I invite you to trust me today. Trust me with your heart. It's time for heart surgery. Do not let your worship be limited in this season by internal frustration. In fact, worship is the very place I'm asking you to leave it at my feet. I am teaching you how to call frustration friend. It's a safeguard against complacency, apathy, and lethargy. You've been asking so many unanswered questions in your life, and now I'm going to teach you how to ask the right questions. Understand that the why questions I may never answer in this, in this life. Why is an invalid question that makes you an invalid. I'm placing how and what in your mouth this day. Those questions will move you forward. I love you, beloved. Keep moving forward. The journey ahead is pressing, but hold on to my beloved son who went through his own pressing, surrendered to my will became victory for you. Victory is yours this day. Would everybody stand? I just want to read this over us. Just receive it by faith that this is what the Lord wants to do. I just think that this is a strategic Sunday in our lives where the Lord is just going to release this to us. A new level of communication and favor is being released over you this day. An oil of joy is upon you. A popping of a balloon. The pressure is being released. Don't carry others' burdens. I release you of feeling responsible for other people's mistakes and failures. Forgive yourself. Stop worrying. Spend as much time praying for them as you do talking about them. What if the pain and heartache you went through was necessary to your spiritual growth? What if your rejection at the hands of men has led you right into my perfect will? What if your current and past circumstances are not the problem? What if it's your view of them that is? What if I have placed you in a difficult place to bring light and life? Are you asking questions or are you questioning me? Is the real reason you criticize and judge others is because you want the position that they hold because you think you could do a better job. I invite you to trust me today. Trust me with your heart. It's time for heart surgery. Do not let your worship be limited in this season by internal frustration. In fact, worship is the very place I'm asking you to leave it at my feet. I am teaching you how to call frustration friend. It's a safeguard against complacency, apathy, and lethargy. You have been asking so many unanswered questions in your life. And now I will ask you, or I will teach you how to ask the right questions. Understand that the why questions I may never answer in this life. Why is an invalid question that makes you an invalid? I'm placing how and what in your mouth this day. Those questions will move you forward. I love you, beloved. Keep moving forward. The journey ahead is pressing. Hold on to my beloved son who went through his own pressing. Surrender to my will and became victory for you. Victory is yours this day. Father, we just leave in victory, Father. Though we 
just thank you, Lord, for speaking to us in, in the right season, at the right time. Father, I pray, Lord, that these coming months would be great months, Lord, of learning how to, Lord, seek frustration as friend. Lord, I pray, Lord, that all these words that we've spoken would take deep root in our heart. Lord, some are so fearful of calling that person. Lord, some are worried about their job or about family, who they might offend. Lord, I pray, Lord, that favor indeed would be ours. Lord, that in obedience, Lord, you would, Lord, break the hardness of men's hearts. Lord, I pray that you would stop waiting for someone to repent in order for us to forgive. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that we would resist and not move in a critical and judgmental spirit in this hour. Lord, may we find people face to face. Lord, we welcome change this day. Come and have your way in our hearts. Lord, we get rid of all bitterness and anger, rage, brawling, slander, any unwholesome talk that has come out of our mouth. We repent this day. We repent and break agreement with those lives. And I pray, Lord, for restored relationship. Lord, a family in here that is going to become so vibrant and so full of life. And the Lord says to a family in here that your family is so um, out of whack and out of sync. There's the air is that you can't breathe. There's no oxygen. And the Lord says, I'm going to clean the air out. And it's time for clean air to be in your house this day. And that will come as you learn how to communicate rightly your frustrations and what everybody is feeling. Everybody. Not someone dominating conversation, but every person, young or old, no matter whether it hurts or not, they are able to share frustrations. And God will give you ways to deal with it. Lord, we strengthen ourselves today. Lord, we go to prayer with the ephod. Lord, we pursue relationship just like David did. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray.